we asked you to ask us questions that we can answer for you. So we collected a bunch of the questions that we got. Why should I pay an agent to sell my house when they are selling themselves? Do I have to be a U.S. citizen to buy a home? Why would I give up my 3% interest rate? What is a home appraisal and why is it important? Why are HOA fees so high? Why did my mortgage payment go up? Aren't they supposed to stay the same? Welcome back to Millennia. It's go time. It's go time. So why don't you explain what we're doing here? So a couple weeks back, which I mean, in real time, it was like last week, but in watching this time, it was probably two months ago, (laughs) we asked you to ask us questions that we can answer for you. So we collected a bunch of the questions that we got. Seth and I both picked about five. There might be more than that in there. There might be more than 10. Mm -hmm. I don't know total. And we wrote them down. We mixed them around in a little bowl. We're going to see how far we get too. And then uh, we're going to answer them. I have gonna, no idea. We're, what... we're going to try to stay away from word salad answers. Yeah, we'll see. I think we should think of this more of as like a lightning round than anything. All like, right, fine. That's fine. Like, Honestly, well. Like if anybody's like needs more information on these questions, on these answers, I'm not saying like we give two sentence answers, but I don't want to spend 10 minutes a piece on these things. I don't know what Seth wrote down. I only know what I wrote down. Okay. And at least I know that with my questions, they are pretty straightforward. But we'll see. I well, don't know. Why don't you go first? So Seth is like freaking me out. I don't know what he wrote. And probably the hardest part about this is going to be reading his handwriting. Because if you don't know, it's awful. It's terrible. Ladies first. So like you're answering what you pick. You're not going to. Yeah. yeah. We wrote it on post-its and we did yes. not put sticky side in. <laughs> so they're all going to stick to each other. What's your favorite part of your job? Okay. So I'm answering the ones I pick out. Yeah. I'm not, okay. My favorite part of my job. You wrote that very nicely too. For anybody who needs to know Seth's handwriting as a lefty. Favorite part of my job. Where do we start? <laughs> it's genuinely helping people. I've said that before. Yeah. I've always been. All right, that's it. I'm, I'm going. All right, cool. <laughs> <laughs> I've always been in a customer facing industry my uh, whole working career. I work best with people. I like helping people. I like making them feel better than they did beforehand and making a bigger difference for them. So I love getting to the finish line and actually getting them and ha- helping them achieve their goals and using us, helping them with a system to take away anxieties and make it a more seamless process. It sounds so generic and freaking printed on a piece of paper what I'm supposed to say, but that's what I genuinely love doing. And I do believe that's why so many people are in this industry because I think people like to help other people and they want to try to help them with this whole process. But I think I like doing it mostly because I like to note that people are being educated while they're doing it and that like, I like knowing that I am meant to be in this field to be able to help people because there are some people who are in this industry who don't take that extra time to like really educate themselves and strategize and get creative and who are not really as much like people peoples that they need to be to be able to like get it done and I like that I am in this industry because I like to do it and it only helps people that's what I like about my job okay that's good and I like seeing really cool houses yeah yeah. (laughs) oh what is earnest money look at that that was one that I had for you but I'm gonna answer it this was a question I got. Is this your hand? No, this is mine. No, that's right? your handwriting. This is mine, right? Mm-hmm. Do you have one in here that says Ernest Money? Uh, no, not quite. Not quite? Not quite. Do we need to combine them? No, it's fine. Okay. So Ernest Money, I got this question on Sunday. And we actually just talked about this two episodes ago, too. We did. That's why I cut you off. Oh. Because <laughs> uh, I was like, I'll, I'll talk about it too much because I knew this question was going to come up. Um, so Ernest Money, I got this question, just kind of how it works, why it is what it is, and you know how it kind of works in a real estate transaction. So Ernest Money is essentially a deposit. And I am not an attorney, but my understanding is that a contract needs what's called consideration, which is money needs to be exchanged in order to like fully enforce a contract. So in the end, this deposit is placed shortly after two parties sign an agreement of sale. The In the state of Pennsylvania, 90% of the time, most of the time, the money is then held by the seller's real estate agent. And what that really means is that it's put into an escrow account, like at an office. It's not the real estate agent holding the money, it's their office. The only people who can hold the money are brokers. And then at settlement, that money is brought by the listing agent to settlement, and that goes directly towards your closing costs. Because that was the question that that came up. It was like, well, what happens to my deposit? Like, right, do yeah. I need that money, or I get that money back? Like, if you're told that your closing cost, if you're asking me, a closing cost are going to be thirty thousand dollars. It's not going to be thirty eight thousand dollars if you put in eight thousand dollars. Yeah. So it's basically your closing costs are going to be 
whatever it is less the deposit because the deposit goes directly towards your closing costs at settlement. So that was a question that I got. Yeah. So but, if your closing costs are $30,000, it's not going to be 30 and your deposit was $8,000. It's going to be $22,000 left to bring to settlement. Yes, exactly. So that's pretty much it. It'd be great if the one that I have followed you want, this You up. want to answer your own question? <laughs> yes. <laughs> This is literally the one that I said, wow, this would be a really good one to follow this up with. And it's the one that I got. (laughs) What is escrow and why do I have to put my money in it? This was actually meant for, we, I swear to God, we didn't plan this. That's the exact same question. No, it's not. No. So where I came with this is, so people have asked me, and actually more than one person asked me this, is with your mortgage payment. So we talk about escrow with like deposit, but there's also an escrow account for your mortgage with interest and the principal going towards your mortgage is say like $1,900, but your mortgage payment is like 2,600. Like what is the rest of that money? And like, why is it more? And we say, well, that's your escrow account. People are like, well, what is in that? So to answer that, so your escrow account, that is the account. So you're paying extra on top of your principal and interest to cover your taxes for your property. So that if you get a tax bill, then that goes to the mortgage company and then they pay your real estate taxes for you, for your property and your school taxes. Unless you're in Laura Pottsgrove and they have a surprise one that you didn't know about. That's my problem. Uh, (laughs) And it also pays for your biggest ones are going to be that. And then your homeowner's insurance is where that also comes into play too. Yeah. So basically an escrow account, it's the fund that the lender keeps on hand to pay your taxes and insurance. Yep. That worked out really hilarious. I I got escrow and earnest confused. I was like, well, wait. Why should I pay an agent to sell my house when they are selling themselves? When the houses are selling themselves? Oh, when the houses are selling themselves. This is my question that I've gotten from somebody. Are you understanding the question? I understand the question. We got to think about it. Well, no, I'm just thinking to myself. I'm actually, I was actually thinking about who asked you this question. Eh. The shithead? Which one? (laughs) It was, uh, it was the one. person. The person who asked this question doesn't really have a full understanding, and I'm not being defensive. I'm just stating a fact. They probably don't have a full understanding of the scope of duties that. Uh, I don't think you know who it was. Okay. It was actually this question that this person asked me because their parents will not use an agent to okay. sell houses. Well, listen. Sometimes you can get away. I'm gonna just throw it out there. Sometimes you can sell a house by yourself. It's fine. I actually was having this conversation over the weekend with somebody and he was joking about how he'd always go FISBO or whatever. He, he was, he was full of shit. He was, he's going to use an agent, but he's never going to sell. He's like, yeah, you know, he, li- he lives with, it's just him and his, and his wife and they have no reason to sell anytime soon. Listing a house right now is like dropping food into a fishbowl. I mean, it's like you, you, the amount of calls and the amount of logistical headaches that you would have to endure. If you have a house that's priced right and a good location and good condition, it would consume everything that you did for at least a week. And then on top of that, most people don't understand all the nuances of the contract. Mm-hmm. Like I love my FISBOs because they don't, I mean, not that I would try to deceive anybody, but like it's not my job as a buyer's agent to tell FISBO the ins and outs of a, of a contract. Mm-hmm. And I got a really bad taste in my mouth too one time when somebody said that they will not, it was somebody who was on Facebook or whatever, and they said, uh, oh no, well, like, because they were selling off market. And I said, oh, I actually have a buyer who would like, really want that like can you send me some details he said well i'm not working with an agent i said if you don't want i said first of all if you want me to double represent like i can talk to you about that if you don't want to use an agent that's perfectly fine i'm happy to just like help you with doing the transactional stuff and if you don't want me involved at all that's also fine i'm not telling you to use me i'm just saying i have a buyer who would like to have it he did not want a buyer to be represented and i was like that's shady yeah Because like, okay, so you want to prey on somebody else and just like be able to take advantage of them. And so they can't be represented yeah, and be able to be told, no, that's not right. Or no, that's not fair. Mm -hmm. I didn't like that. Yeah. And so I think that there's a underestimation, even in this market, I always say it's like 30 days worth of activity shoved into three. I mean, I'm like just short of like sending my family out of town when I have a listing that's really, I mean, I'm on the phone all day answering questions. I keep sellers' asses out of a sling with the disclosure and trying to navigate, negotiating, and answering questions the right way. But all the lead up too. Like a lot of listing agents are buyer's agents. Like I can tell you, I can walk in and and you pay me for my advice on like what buyers are going to want. I had a seller just earlier in the year 
And she's just like, I'm just amazed at like what we got for the house. Uh, the, the process was so smooth and everything like that. And I said, listen, you did everything I told you to do. And we worked for four months to get that property on the market. And it was a home run. We had multiple offers. And the house was not like HDTV ready. It was old. It had a lot of deferred maintenance, but it was in the right market and it was priced right. And so I would just say, just be sure that you're not leaving any money on the table by. You so are, and, even in any market. I mean, what, I'm sorry, but like, I know you're supposed to be answering this question and I know I wrote it, but like, if you're selling yourself without an agent, you are for, like, sure, you can like throw it up on like the local like homes for sale, like sites and whatever. And that's fine. But like, that is that really where the serious buyers are? I mean, it's nope. not going into the MLS. It's not getting sent out to the people who are actually like qualified and working with a buyer's agent who are actually serious about purchasing. And you get my favorite is the neighbors that say, oh, I'll buy the house. But like then they like really don't or they it's lowball you. Low and and there's so many guys who are like, I'll buy your house. If you ever sell, just let me know. I'll buy it. Oh and almost, it almost never works out. Yeah, it's it's bullshit. I would just say, definitely be sure you know what you're getting yourself in for. And you'll never know if you lost yourself money. There's a lot of guys who will sit there, oh, I sold my house on my own. It's like... Mm, Until okay. the neighbor sells and uses an agent. And, and they get <laughs> you know, $50,000 more than what that guy got. So I can appreciate this question, though, in some respects, because I've said this a million times on this podcast, that people are off doing their own thing. And they're really, I'm sure they're good at their accountants and plumbers and everything like that. And they, they don't know what they don't know. And it's just, it's easy for people to be like, oh, well, it's easy. You know, it's like, ah, oh, just put a sign on the lawn. Everyone comes in and I, I get to pick my buyer. But it can be very overwhelming too. It can because be super you will get, overwhelming. You'll get freaking. I do this for a everybody. living and I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> I do this for a living and it's like it hijacks. Well, because in this, like you can't just like always go. I mean, you might be able to get it up on like Zillow or something maybe. But like if somebody, if they see like a for sale thing, they can't always find it online. No. And it's hard to even like find your house yeah, and, and be and able it to. Is exposure. And the other thing that a lot of people don't realize is that brokerages pay for premier placement on these Zillows and all these sites. And it's like, you put your little Fizbo on there. Trust me, it'll go up. But, and you might list it and it's there for a little bit, but it just gets lost in the sauce because you've got Remaxes and Coldwell Bankers and KWs and Compasses of the world paying for that premier placement. So that's another good point. But. Yep. All right, let's go to the next one. Do I have to be a U.S. citizen to buy a home? <laughs> Triggered. Triggered. <laughs> Were you thinking about what I'm so currently thinking you're, you're about? Like our, you're our ITIN expert. Yes. <laughs> yes, I am. Unfortunately. No, it was a fantastic learning experience. So, no, you do not. But there is, you do have to have an ITIN number, at least. It's something to talk to a lender about and see what programs are available. So, you can. It will cost you a lot more cash out of pocket, though. Yes. You won't get as good of a rate. Not every lender is going to be able to have the loan product to do it. If you are not an American citizen or a U.S. citizen or have some other kind of pretty solid classification, you're not going to be underwritten by like what a normal American citizen would be, the entity. So Fannie and Freddie, which are like the two, they service, I think, 90% of the loans in this country you are going to have to go all off market and it's basically, it's called a non QM loan. Yeah. And you essentially, I mean, God, what did she pay? In it? What did, what did it was 10%, 10.75%. Interest rate. Interest rate. Yeah. It was something like something that. So yeah. So it's a higher risk. So yeah. But and yes. it's something to be very, 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 very upfront about too. And I don't mean just saying it's the lender once. I mean, multiple times before you hand yeah. in any information. This is a, it actually happened, I don't know if I told you this, it happened to a friend of mine too, whose wife is not a US citizen because she's from Australia. It was a hellish experience yeah. for them too on the lending side because they did not hear them out about what they were looking to do and that she couldn't be on the loan and that ended up costing them like, oh my God, like tens of thousands yeah. more. So short answer, yes, you can, but if you are going to like make sure that you're doing your research into programs, who offers them and that and the, the one that we had was they went to a lender because of an advertisement for this ITIN loan program, told them about it. And the person, because it was just like a paid lead on the, the company's ends, like they were like, yeah, 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 sure. And then like just approved them FHA for, I still couldn't even tell you what reason. 
and it just jumbled everything up. It, so it make sure that forever. things it took like four months to close it. So it's, it did. It closed. We it, got there. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. We got it done. It took two lenders and four months and a lot of contract extensions. And our because, lender is the one who ended up getting it. And our, our lender was the one. That's the reason why we work with our lender and not just some guy off the street. And also, I would say if you are going to investigate this, if you're listening and you don't live in our market, definitely go with a more niche, smaller bank. Because these big banks really, I mean, they offer this stuff, but they don't need to process these loans. They don't need the risk profile in their mortgages. So, so yes, you can. It's going to cost a lot more money. But it can happen. And don't discount the idea. Also, between that, there's also student visas. There's the HB1 visa. There's a lot of different working visas that people can work with. So it just depends on uh, doing your due diligence and making sure that you're crystal clear on what your immigration status is now and what it will be. If you've, uh, I think there's a different, there's a nuance with if you actually have applied for citizenship, there's mm-hmm. like, there's different stuff. So yeah, just do not withhold anything. Don't like keep any information to yourself about it. Throw everything out on the table and make sure that it's something that they yeah. can actually and, do because they will find out. And <laughs> I had a long conversation with our lender and there's a understandable hesitancy to just open up all your personal business to an American lender. Like we get it. But if you want to be able to own a home in this country, you're going to have to play ball with the banking institutions. With their, they're going to give you the money to do it. All right. What do we got? Oh, I got another Nusky question. Mm. Let's see what we got. Why would I give up my 3% interest rate? <laughs> Somebody ask you this? Mm-hmm. Or how many thousands of people asked you this? The, how many thousands of how people many? have asked me this? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we did get into it last episode, so. We did. We recorded three episodes right before this one, and we're finding that uh, we answered some of these things. If you didn't watch them, then here you're getting answers now. And if you want to watch them, go watch them. Yeah. Or listen to them, whatever. Just, just go back and watch them and listen to them anyway. Yep. It's good. So why would I give up my 3% interest rate? I'll parrot what I said before, is that there's more to life than just an interest rate. Now, I wouldn't try to, quote, sell somebody to take a 7% interest rate for an extra bedroom. But there are times when I think people are kind of drinking the sand on a house that doesn't really serve them. It's not necessarily ever was supposed to be their forever home. The house is too big. It's not in the right school district. The the house is in is like weird. It's unique. It's in a niche kind of market. I think there's a lot of reasons why you would give it up. I think also somebody could sell a house for 3%, take a 6% rate and wait for interest rates to come down because interest rates will come down. People don't understand like right now, interest rates are hovering in that high six to seven area. They are going to come down one way or another. Either they're going to come down at the Fed's discretion or an economy will force them to come down. So I think that people need to see the forest through the trees. They need to see that there's more to life than just a low mortgage payment. Again, I'm not going to tell people that that they should just do it because it's fun or the reward has to outweigh the interest rate. But I think there's going to be a lot of people in in the coming two years that are going to have a hard time grappling with that question. Mm -hmm. Okay. What is a home appraisal and why is it important? Well, as much as we like to give appraisers shit as the bad guy, (laughs) they help keep the real estate market from going absolutely insane and inflated even though it might appear as if it has over the past couple of years, because mm, it has, but we also kind of do. We can fault a lot of things for that. But the appraiser basically, let me back up. What is an appraiser or what is an appraisal? Appraisal is what is executed by an appraiser to assess the value of the house. When you get the appraisal, it goes back to underwriting with the lender and it'll tell the lender how much the bank will be permitting to lend. Okay. I cover that correctly, adequately sure. for yourself. Kind and of, why I is kind it important? Of for me. I'm, just, I'm assuming you did fantastic. You mean that you mean appraisals don't get you super wired and ready not, to go for not, money? Not when we're talking in the abstract. I certainly pay attention to them when I'm on uh, the buyer seller side. Yes. So it's pretty much one of the biggest hurdles. Make sure. So usually during a transaction, if you, there's two hurdles you want to get past before it's you know you're pretty much like in the clear, versus inspections. If you got them, second is appraisal. So once you clear your appraisal, so if you're say you offered four thousand dollars for the house. And it appraises for $415,000. Congratulations. You now have $15,000 worth of equity in your house right off the bat because it's worth more than you're buying it for. So that's awesome. So that would be a high appraisal. We love those. They're more if you are in far between. Then there's a low appraisal, which is where negotiation is going to have to come into play. And if you get a low appraisal, that means if you offered $400,000, that's what you're under contract for. 
and it appraises for say like $390,000, there is $10,000 that you need to decide what you're going to do about it. So the bank will only put through a loan based off of a $390,000 value. That doesn't mean that they will loan $390,000, depending on how much you're putting down and what program you have. There's $10,000 that you need to figure out. So some of the things you do, you go back to the listing agent. You can either negotiate to, ideally, it would be the best if you just bump the sale price down to three ninety to what the value is. Wash your hands, be like, okay, sweet, done. Figure that out next. The seller does not have to agree to it. And if you cannot come to terms, then that falls under your mortgage contingency which is the pretty much like the last contingency holding into your contract. And if you get a low appraisal, you guys don't come to terms, then you can walk away from the house and walk away from the deal, get your deposit back. Or you can do, you can either just come with that extra $10,000 cash at settlement to make up the difference. Um, it doesn't go towards the equity, but with that amount, I mean, give it like a year, you're going to earn that back with what it's going to end up being worth. So you can come with the full amount or you can meet in the middle somewhere and say like either you can bump the sale price down to maybe like 395 and then you come with an extra $5,000 or you can just keep it at 300,000 and then both of you pay 5,000 at closing but there are ways around it and ways to negotiate it but it is important to prevent you from overpaying for the house and keeping the market at least somewhat stable across the board okay cool so appraisal and why it's important yep did you get another one for me? Why are HOA fees so high? Didn't we have this? this who, who guessed this? This is something that came across the... One of my friends that I haven't heard from in a while. Well, that's good. Well, yeah. that's good. I mean, it's, yeah, people are coming, coming to us for the information, that's which nice is the right hear. move. Mm -hmm. uh, why are HOA fees so high? Well, first of all, high is relative. Mm -hmm. I always advise my buyers, you need to understand what you're getting for your HOA fee. And a lot of times... You know, the amenities are there. You know, you understand. You got a pool, you got a playground, you got a clubhouse, a big, you got lots of common area, or the HOA covers a lot about the exterior house. So, a lot of times, what will happen is buyers don't understand the difference between a condo and an HOA. So, an HOA is essentially like a planned. You want to define HOA? HOA is a homeowners association. And essentially, what that is, is it's a bunch of deeded lots in a grouping, and they all are in the same community. Usually what that really means is that there are common elements to the property and the community itself that everyone has to pitch in to take care of. So it can be as simple. I mean, I've seen stuff as like $100 a year, and it's literally just maintaining a drainage base. My friend's is like $79 or like $78 a year or a month, something like that. Yep. Basically, your HOA fee, your homeowner association fee needs to be commensurate with whatever is being maintained. So- the condos, which are not HOAs, but they're kind of the same thing. A condo building, whether it's a high rise in the city or if it's just kind of a sprawling community in the suburbs, condos, usually the fees are higher because you're taking care of the exterior, the roofs, lots of sidewalks. There's more density. A lot of times these condo associations, they have pools, they've got tot lots, they've got clubhouses, that type of thing. So what well, if it's a condo too? keep in mind, if like, say the roof isn't your responsibility, it's kind of like just financing in a cost of the, like if the roof ever has to be replaced, yeah. like that's a cost you that you don't have to pay. You don't have to pay. Uh, a lot of times, <laughs> a lot of times too in condos is that you don't pay water, you don't pay gas, you don't pay utilities because if the water line is all coming and the heater is all servicing multiple units, instead of cutting that all down to into eight pieces every month, it's they easier just for collect them. the fees. Yeah. They just collect the fees and then they just pay the gross amount. So. It's an interesting question. I always dive in and make sure that you're getting the value. The other thing to keep in mind is that sometimes an HOA fee that doesn't have a lot of maintenance, a lot of things to maintain, and the fee is still high, they are raising money for a capital improvement. So keep in mind, HOA and condo boards, who are the people who run these, are, it's just the residents. They're off doing their own professionals and something else. Without a, like a good management company, a lot of times what will happen is an HOA or a condo association will fall behind in the amount of money they need to maintain that roof or to replace the sewer la lines or re-gunite the pool or redo the clubhouse. That rate every month will be inflated because they got to like, catch up, so to speak. That's why, but most HOAs are pretty equitable for what you get. And I think a lack of understanding about what these fees actually go towards is the biggest. Hurt. Yeah. So pretty much say 
why are they so high? That's something you would want to ask. Yeah. And also define what your def- what do you think a ho- is too high for an HOA fee? A non like high rise building mm-hmm. or for an HOA, not a condo. Yeah, HOA. HOA without a pool. Mm-hmm. That's the other thing. A lot of people are like HOA. So and I, I say th- more HOA communities without pools than I do with. Yeah, exactly. But a lot of times, if your agent doesn't know there's a pool in the like, a lot of times you can pull into a community. You don't even pass by the pool with the clubhouse, and the buyer has no idea. And they're like, "Well, what the hell are we paying all this?" this well, first of all, before I even am showing anybody a property, if it's in an HOA, if I'm fi- or in an HOA community, I'm finding out what the HOA covers because that's going to be the first question. Well, that's because you're, you're Jen Musky. That's because I'm Jen fucking Musky. You're Jen you're fucking Musky. <laughs> but in the end, I would say a non-pool, non uh, having to take care of the exterior of homes, like I don't know, probably, but once you once you get past like two fifty, yeah. That gets to be like, okay, what am I paying for? If I'm paying like three, three fifty a month, you better, you better be cutting my lawn. Well, they're going to cut your, <laughs> yeah, I would say, yeah, if they're even at two fifty, I would say, and really what I mean by HOA, like that's really for like townhouse communities. Hmm. You'll get where if you have single family homes, it'll probably be closer. If it's two fifty, there better be a pool or something going on in there because usually you have to mow your own lawn and take care of your own lot. And they just have to take care of common areas. Now, the more rural you get, the more like acreage they have to mow as common area. And a lot of times the township requires it because they have to like maintain the drainage swales and all that. It can kind of be all over the map. Non high rise condo, I think once you pass like 350, 400, I think you got to really start looking at like what the hell. God, I'm looking at some in the fit in the city right now for a client and yeah. some of those condo fees, man. Woo. Yeah. Uh, like we're keeping it under. I think we're capping it at $700 a month in condo fees. Wow, yeah. yeah and like I've seen some that are like, oh, I wish our MLS would let us like cap like with condo slash HOA fees up to whatever up to, I yeah. can't. So I have to like manually like, you know, yeah. filter those out. But there are some for like, oh my God, I think the most I saw for a condo fee was like $1,100. Yeah. <gasps> yeah. yeah you, can get some, you can get stuff on the main line too. They're that like, that's really expensive. But a Wild. lot of times they're, they've got like real infrastructure issues. They got to like maintain, you know, that's, there's a doorman and yeah. And there's like, I mean, just old, like just old pipes and they got to replace all the electric or they got to replace all this, that or the other. The other thing in high rise condos, people don't think about it, elevators. Hmm. Super expensive because not a lot of people do them. That's a big nut. It's like I think the one bucks. I was thinking of too on top of it has a rooftop pool. That'll definitely add to it. Yeah. Keep in mind, a lot of these HOA fees, insurance. Liability insurance for people slipping and falling mm. on the elements that the HOA is responsible for. A little fun fact, when you buy in an HOA or condo, the lender has to contact the association to make sure there's no litigation that exceeds their general liability policy. Hmm. Because That I didn't know, actually. Yeah, so like if there's a slip and fall... And they've got a limited liability policy of a million bucks, and they're being sued for two million. Mm. The insurance company only covers a million. Where's the other million coming from? It's coming from the residents. Oof. So the lender wants to know: Is there going to be a special assessment based on a loss in this lit- in, the lit- in the litigation? Well, well, fun fact. Okay. All right. So you, yeah, can, tell so your, you, can, so you can tell your friend. Just there a- it is. <laughs> a- a- ask Jen. <laughs> All right. Last one. Why did my mortgage payment go up? Aren't they supposed to stay the same? My friend asked me this. Great question. Yes. So you buy a house because you never have to worry about your rent going up an unpredicted amount at any point in time. My friend's mortgage payment ended up going up and he did not expect that. I believe we had the conversation, but you know, when you're going through a home buying experience, there's so much information coming at you that like your brain doesn't absorb all of it. If you have not purchased yet and you will at some point, or if you currently own, then listen to this because this is something that does happen that shouldn't fly under your radar and to be expected. So your mortgage payment can change. It can go up. Typically not drastically though. So if you notice your mortgage payment go up, it would would be because your taxes went up. So I just got done telling you about escrow account and what gets paid from that. So sometimes if they haven't pulled enough money into your escrow account to cover all the taxes, then they will increase your mortgage to cover the cost of the taxes is one reason. It could also be that your homeowner's insurance may have gone up because of claims. Those are really like the two biggest reasons that they would, um, unless there is like a special assessment that's done where the township needs to get something done for whatever reason, the funding doesn't cover it. Then they go to the residents to have to pay for that. So those are a few things, a few reasons why. But like I said, it's not typically drastic. Like my mortgage payment just went up maybe, I think it was like 40 bucks a month, 40, 50 bucks a month for the next 12 months. 
So it goes up, but it's no, not like it's going to change. No landlord raises your rent $40. It's always 100 Right. I never have to worry about getting displaced out of my house. Yeah. That is the other thing a lot of people don't talk about is that unless you just don't stop paying your mortgage altogether, like no one can take your house away from you. So we help a lot of people who, you know, they're getting a rent raised all the time. And then it says, oh, by the way, uh, yeah, we're going to sell it. Yep. Your mortgage payment can change. That can be why. It doesn't have to do with your interest rate, though. So typically that'll be fixed. And if you ever have questions about why your mortgage payment changed, then you just reach out to your mortgage company and they will be able to tell you. One thing also uh, to keep in mind is that sometimes they will do one higher payment for like a makeup. So instead of raising it incrementally, they'll just do like, okay, we need to replenish it because your taxes went up. So they'll be like, okay, instead of paying you know, 2200 you're going to pay 2475 or something like that just to make, you know, to make sure that they have, because they have to keep a certain amount of money in the escrow account for based on the terms and conditions of which that loan is sold, meaning like your lender sells it to somebody else and says, okay, if you're going to service this loan, you have to keep a certain baseline. So it's that kind of out of the control of the lender. Which by the way, that happens a lot. And that's actually something that nobody asks. Nobody, I don't think anybody knows about that side of it, which I'm glad you mentioned it. So this is going to be a bonus tidbit of information. The majority of the time, with the exception of so some lenders will hold your loan. So the company that our lender is with will hold your loan for a lifetime of the loan. But more times than not, and pretty much standard practice, is you work with one company to get you your loan and to get you into the home. And then after... You have purchased it and after it's issued, then they will sell the loan and it'll be sold to a different company. So my current mortgage is with a mortgage company that I did not purchase my home with. So they sell them off and that is normal and that is okay. And again, if you were to ever have like questions of why am I getting this mortgage statement from a company I've never heard of before, you just talk to the lender that you'd been working with and they will tell you. Yep. So... And we might have a guest on to talk about the mortgage markets and all that good stuff if anyone's really interested in how the sausage is made. But yeah, and then uh, we do have a lightning round for Jen. She doesn't know about it. Why? Well, because I'm going to just ask questions. It's really easy. Okay. Okay? Don't get too nervous. Which do you like better? Oh, okay. Music or movies? Music. That's the wrong answer. I don't care. My attention span sometimes can't hold on to movies. Baseball or football? Football. That's an easy one. Dogs or cats? Oh, man. Owning or enjoying other people's? Whatever. Uh, Cats, because I love my cat. I love both. I want to pet your dog. Avril Lavigne or Taylor Swift? Oh, uh, Taylor Swift. You have to respect Taylor Swift. It's insane. Beach or mountains? What's the time of year? Ideal both. Ideal mountains, ideal beach. Which way? You got to spend one day somewhere. Which be, Are we talking like tropical? Are we talking tropical or are we talking like wildwood? Ideal. So whatever you... I'll me. go beach, but I love the mountains. Okay. Tea or coffee? Coffee. Wawa. Wow, wow. Hmm. Uh, Apple or Android? Apple. Truck or car? Mm, truck. Christmas or Thanksgiving? Christmas. One place you'd go before you die. Ooh, Alaska or somewhere where, or the Netherlands where I can see the Northern Lights. I, I was going to say, I can't believe you. I, I thought you'd be like scanning. I was picking which one. I was, I was trying to figure say, out like, where. Anywhere I can see the Northern Lights. Yes. What would you name yourself if you could change your name? Oh my God. I was asked this on a recent podcast and I was stumped. Probably because my name is awesome, but I've never really. I, my name's pretty. I think my name is probably going to start becoming like old people names it is i don't know can i just change it and tell you what my name would have been if oh yeah it wasn't yeah, yeah, yeah. Gert. gertrude gertrude my dad wanted to name me gertrude i was like ew how would you even shorten it trudy he said no he said gertie <laughs> i was like how is that better that is like in no world it is, better it is Ger- <laughs> no offense to the gertrudes out there i mean i have a rare name i have a weird name like seth but gertrude is one of those i know names multiple that- seths well, yeah, and there's some famous us. There's, I don't think there's any famous Gertrudes, are there? Gertrude Hawk. <laughs> That's not famous. I don't know who it is, so it's not famous. It's chocolate. Okay. Oh, um, that was a good right. lightning round. I thought it was like going to be on the spot, and I had to come up with the answers. It's so much better. Okay. Yes. All right. I, I was I was not going to put you on the spot. All right. All right. Yes, you would. Okay. There See you guys. have it. If you have more questions, actually, though, we yeah. want to know them. We might actually start adding in a segment of uh, answering a question per podcast. So drop more questions. Yeah, want and them. We're, we're thinking about adding a second episode for each week, and that would be a great, great format 
at least for some of those like Friday afternoon drops. Yeah. So you can drop the comment on YouTube if you're watching it there. And if not, just uh, at Millennia Podcast, double L, double N, double P. If you're not sure how to spell it, it's just double letter. Double letter. <laughs> you got it. All right. See you guys. All right. Bye.